Welcome to Ideas Sunday. It's February 24th, 2019. The horrific report on Cuyahoga County jail conditions may lead to more defendants receiving conditional releases on bail as they await trial. We spotted an issue where people were being detained because they did not have any resources, and that's not fair and that's not justice. We'll examine the possibilities. A new supermarket may be exactly what a developing neighborhood wants, unless you were better served by the old location. The pros and cons of closing a flagship store. And a digital memory bank emerges to protect recollections lost as the Holocaust generation slips away. You have to remember the past. It should never be forgotten. Idea Sunday is next. Brought to you by Westfield. Offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams. Good morning and welcome to Ideas Sunday. I'm Rick Jackson. Thank you so much for joining us. We begin this morning with a shocking story of injustice and of a wrongfully imprisoned man's astonishing fortitude. In 1975, salesman Harry Franks was murdered as he exited the Fairmount Cut Rate store just south of University Circle on Cleveland's east side. Twelve-year-old Edward Vernon told police he knew who did it and identified three neighbors, 21-year-old Wiley Bridgman, his 17-year-old brother Ronnie, and their friend Ricky Jackson, who was 18. In 2011, Kyle Swenson, then a reporter for Scene, Cleveland's alternative weekly newspaper, spotlighted their case with a deeply reported story showing all kinds of inconsistencies. The Ohio Innocence Project got involved, and in 2013, Vernon signed an affidavit recanting his story, which set off a chain of events that more than a year later led to the exoneration of all three men. Wiley Bridgman and Ricky Jackson were then free to join Ronnie Bridgman, who had by then changed his name to Kwame Ajamu. He'd been paroled years before and worked to free them. Among his efforts, meeting with Swenson and sharing a trove of documents. Swenson and Ajamu sat down with Ideastream's Mike McIntyre to discuss this miscarriage of justice chronicled in Swenson's new book, Good Kids, Bad City, a story of race and wrongful conviction in America. It was in 1975 uh, uh, very uh, chagrinful for a 17-year-old kid man to be wrongfully incarcerated um, based upon a, a lie that was uh, perpetuated by a friend, a neighborhood uh, a little boy that uh, was, in fact, our paper boy. You know, mm -hmm. I went to school with his sister. You know, just on and on and on. You know, and this um, was an atrocity that I, I, my little mind couldn't couldn't comprehend. Um, the mere fact that uh, those people in control of the situation was telling me to to be silent and accept this this uh, situation that wasn't a given. You know, um, it was uh, something that uh, you know I like to use bestowed. Uh, things, uh, when it's bestowed upon you, have absolutely nothing to do with it. It comes to you either good or bad. In my particular situation, as well as Ricky and my brother, it was very bad. It was very endearing and very trying on our mentals. Kwame mentions that it's this 12-year-old's testimony that essentially convicts him. Yeah. Kyle, that's true. There's no physical evidence. There's really no other testimony except this story, which, by the way, changed at every one of the trials. Absolutely. I mean, there was no physical evidence whatsoever. Uh, all they had were the words of Edward Vernon. Uh, no gun was found that was used in the crime. The cash that was stolen was never found. So basically, you had a situation where it was this boy's word against these three young men's word. And the jury believed this boy, despite the fact that all over his testimony was all over the place. Mm. In every th they had there were three separate trials, and in each trial he gave varying uh, testimonies that contradicted one another. And on top of that, there was evidence that he had given another statement to police that was even another wilder version of the story. So he was all over the place with his testimony, and unfortunately, you know the jury believed him, and that's kind of one of the shocking things I think uh, about this case. At least for me, it was is that juries get it wrong sometimes. Mm. You're, you're working for Scene. You've been a reporter there for all of six months, I think. Yeah, uh, ba yeah basically. Yeah. And so you, you get this, uh, hey, let's, let's go meet a guy who has a story. And I think it's sort of an inside joke with reporters or a comment, you know, how many innocent prisoner 
males. Exactly. The yeah. pieces of mail do you get? So you're meeting somebody who, at that time, Kwame, you were you had been paroled. Mm -hmm. that so went through the entire system. So yeah. you're through and you're out. And in fact, you got a little bit lucky because there was a clerical error in prison where they did your social security number wrong. Exactly. So now you're not tainted by that number exactly. and you have a different name. Exactly. So you've built a whole new life. Mm -hmm. And yet you're there with these documents saying, I've got to get these other two exonerated. No and doubt. he meets with you, Kyle. Uh, how in that meeting did he convince you that you should make the next phone call or look at the next document? Yeah, well, I, so I was, you know, 25 at the time. Yeah. And I think Kwame's told the story often that he's quite <laughs> unimpressed with this, this uh, disheveled kid who rolled in there. And look at uh, you today. <laughs> comes a boy, comes a length. But because uh, I think he expected a kind of Peter Jennings in a yeah. trench coat with a, with, a, with a cigar or something. But no, I, I came in and I sat down and I remember, you know, I had had the experience of talking to other people who claimed that they hadn't done something before. They'd been wrapped up mm -hmm. in a criminal situation that they weren't involved with. Uh, and it and having investigated it and found out that, you know, it wasn't necessarily, they weren't telling me the truth. Um, but, you know, sitting down with Kwame, I remember he, he was just very clear about his story. He didn't seem kind of desperate to get me to believe him. He just was saying, you know, these are the facts. This is what happened. Will you look into this? And of course, I always say this now, but he had this b big box of documents, which, uh, you know, that makes every reporter's heart flutter a little bit because right. you know that there's some documentation that backs this up. Um, and it's not just empty talk. And so also his personality, he kind of had a very, and still does, kind of uh, radiated a kind of integrity that I thought was very uh, honest. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I wonder, yeah. Tommy, if part of that was just the fact that you were there. As I mentioned, with this clerical error, with your name change, mm -hmm. you've got a house, a wife, a job. Um, you could say, gee, I'm sorry that happened to those guys, but I did my time and I'm moving on with life. You didn't do that. You no. said, my mission is to exonerate all of us. Exactly. What, what, dro what drove you in that way when you could have essentially put it in the rearview mirror? Well, there's, there's an extreme human factor involved in that, and it's called guilt. Um, I was, um, this case is 39 years old. I did 28 years and was able to circumvent all that by getting a parole. I got a parole and it would take 11 years before Wiley, my brother, and Ricky, my brother from another mother, would be released, you see? So in that time, I met my wife, I got married, I owned three vehicles, I owned a house, not rented, owned. And so guilt, you see, the human factor of guilt was just eating me alive. Even though every day, if I, if I was financially able, I sent him money. When I couldn't, I would use my wife's name. When we couldn't do that, we'd figure out another way because the system didn't want me to take care of them that way financially. You couldn't send uh, money. You could write letters, but you couldn't send monies or nothing that would benefit them. So I had to deal with that. And um, it was just a, a steady climb. But all along, Kyle was somewhere in the, the workings in the back of my mind because it was all about them. And so it was guilt that drove me as it is today, that drives me to fight for every man and woman who cannot fight for themselves. It was getting them out, but also how important was it to then get the name cleared, get yourself exonerated? The three of you declared innocent of this crime that you didn't commit. And the original conviction is in fact vacated. And I know it's been a long time, Mr. Arjavu, and I am so happy to be involved in the privilege of saying to you that I am glad that justice finally arrived for you after all of these years. It wasn't just being incarcerated, right. it, was, it was the end result. So here's a, here's a selfless um, depiction of that as well. Uh, I never even thought about being exonerated. Really? I only thought about, and Kyle would witness to this, I only thought about getting Wiley Bridgman and Ricky Jackson free from physical bondage. I, I, exoneration was the last thing on my mind, you know? Uh, uh, being, being uh, you know, full claimed uh, innocent and all that, hey, I wanted them cats out of prison, just period, you know? And, and, and that's what drove me.
Yeah, and to, to to back him up, he's completely right about that. And and also, you know, it was very it, it was very possible that they wouldn't get out of prison. Exactly. Because especially Ricky Jackson, you know, he had been the alleged shooter. So every time he would go to a parole board, they would say, "Well, you know, we need you to be contrite about your crime." And he would say, "I didn't do this." And then they would stamp ten more years on. Ago. And Wiley, in the same way, because they all proclaimed their innocence, there was no uh, shot really at them for getting a parole. So it's very it's very possible that if these chain of events didn't happen, they would still be incarcerated for the rest yeah. of their lives. Honestly, let's have uh, Erica now join us. She's calling in from Shaker Heights. Hello, Erica. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Good to have you and, with us. Um, thank you. I wanted to ask about any psychological um, help that they might have um, speaked out. And do you speak about that in the book? And have you ever heard of Dr. Joy Deliri, uh post-traumatic play syndrome? Um, it's a really good Heal Thyself book. I just wanted to know what you did for healing the trauma that you've been through. Thank you for the questions. Kwame, what, what did you do to heal the trauma? I mean, so let me carry you to the first part and then again uh, that you understand. Um, and thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, as we know, uh, human beings suffer the worst once the, you are uh, actually in, placed into isolation. This is what causes um, the brain to go, as they say, soft or too much. Uh, but actually what it is is the disconnect from uh, any type of human activities, talking, verbally, you know, seeing people, and so you begin to withdraw. Uh, personally, and I can say this uh, uh, without uh, hesitation, I suffer from uh, um, post-traumatic stress, um, as does any human being has been uh, on death row for more than five minutes. Um, there sure. are cases um, that are worse, uh, so much so that uh, I personally have witnessed uh, men being ex uh, being medicated uh, while we were on the death row, uh, simply because of uh, the stress levels. And uh, over years, the medications become a, a matter of support for them. And so now, even in, in uh, uh, tentative freedom, uh, these men and women are uh, subject to be um, medicated. and. Uh, in the state of Ohio, once that starts, there's no stopping. Uh, so, but um, you have to have uh, it already in you to survive. Survivors are, are not made. Survivors are people who are born. Kwame, you know. though, you, you said that Ronnie Bridgman died on death row. So You became Kwame Ajamu. So Ronnie Bridgman, it's a whole different story, but yes, he, he died in prison, um, 1990, in prison. actually. Uh, I had uh, completed... 15 years of prison and uh, was in uh, general population and uh, went to the parole board for the first time. Uh, and uh, they, of course, gave me a five-year continuance. And so it was a Friday. And so I, uh, I walked past the phone and I decided not to call my mother and disturb her, which I knew it would disturb her heavily to learn that uh, her youngest, her youngest uh, son had got five more years for something that I didn't do. So I said, well, I would wait till Monday, Tuesday, and call her. But she passed away mm. that evening. And so, uh, again, uh, and this has to do with how one can uh, attribute uh, success in being a survival. Uh, I had to go again and find uh, some kind of recluse here uh, because there, there was none. And uh, what happened was uh, I decided I elected to kill Ronnie Bridgman and um, Kwame, which means born on Saturday, okay? Mm -hmm. Wow. Kamau, which means silent warrior. Ajamu means he fights <laughs> for what he wants. Was born 1990 and legalized three days after I decided that that would be who I am. It fits my character and the disposition and everything about me. And it was not haphazard. It was born out of a death, and I wear it proudly. We should note that the hour-long conversation with Kyle Swenson and Kwame Ajamu, including a phone call from a relative of murdered salesman Harry Franks, is available online at ideastream.org ideasnow.
You can also subscribe to the Sound of Ideas podcast on iTunes, Google Play, NPR One, or Stitcher. New episodes are uploaded daily. Moving on to another issue plaguing the justice system, bail reform. The purpose of bail is to assure that defendants show up for court dates. Some defendants get a personal bond and are released on their promise to show up, or pay money if they don't. But many others are required to pay a bondsman to post their bail just to get out of custody. Those who can't pay await trial in a jail cell. In Cuyahoga County, many people spend days or weeks in jail before a trial, even though they're considered innocent until proven guilty. While behind bars, they may lose their jobs, their homes, even custody of their children, all without ever being convicted of any crime. Judges and criminal justice reformers have been talking for years now about how to let more people, especially those charged with nonviolent crimes, skip the jail cell and await trial from home. Now, a big new wrinkle is adding urgency to these talks locally. Release of a federal report describing conditions in the Cuyahoga County Jail as inhumane. IdeaStream's Nick Costell checks in on the state of bail reform here. Since the release of the U.S. Marshals report, protesters have gathered outside county headquarters and the Justice Center. They're outraged about the deaths of several inmates in the jail. We will not rest. We are not done. No justice, no peace. As a reminder, these are the names of the people who have died since June. And they want reforms to reach beyond the jail itself and into the courtrooms, where judges decide who gets locked up in the first place. Cleveland Municipal Court has started taking steps in that direction. They use a risk assessment to gauge who's likely to come back for court and could receive a low bond or personal bond that doesn't cost any money. And last year, the court launched a pretrial services program to help people out on bond. We spotted an issue where people were being detained because they did not have any resources, and that's not fair, and that's not justice. And me and my 12 colleagues believe that we all signed up to do justice. Defendants check in regularly with the nonprofit Oriana House. Some call in, some appear in person, and some wear GPS monitors. It's a way to make sure that people come back for court dates and don't reoffend. The program is just a few months old. The city of Cleveland, um, through the mayor's office, city council, and the court, we already believed that bail reform was important and had decided to go the way of pretrial services as a way to um, reduce pretrial detention. Um, when we started our pretrial services department, you know, the situation in the jail made us increase our, our numbers probably a little faster than we had planned on doing. But that's just in Cleveland. There are 13 municipal courts across Cuyahoga County. They set bail for people charged with felonies before sending them downtown to the Common Pleas Court. And they don't all have the same resources. So if I have someone who's presenting that might they might be a, a threat to themselves, and I'm trying to find a psychiatrist. We are literally on the telephone making calls to private psychiatrists who have to meet certain criteria, and okay, I can see them on Tuesday at 2.45 and they drive to the jail. Another couple days for the report. Things could be different. The municipal courts could all go in together on one pretrial services program. Judges and defendants across the county could be working with one uniform system. So these conversations start to embrace, could we see all of these individuals in one location where all of the social service agencies might gather in one spot? Having our services available to the municipal court is key for them. I've heard them say that. I've heard Judge Montgomery say that. I've heard judges from around the county in the municipal court say that. We don't have the resources to manage this person on a personal bond to help them with maybe issues that they're having on drugs, alcohol, uh, grief, uh, counseling, sessions, anything, because it's not afforded them because of their budget. So if we can have that centralized and everybody could play a part in it and we're all doing it consistently, that centralized pretrial service costs money. Judge John Russo is the administrative and presiding judge of the Common Pleas Court. He's convened meetings of judges and other court officials to talk about these issues. It's a big project. I hope it doesn't end with nobody doing anything, and that's why I think we're continuing to push the buttons to move forward. Um, I think the jail issue has caused a lot now to be concerning about what do you do and how do you do it here in Cuyahoga County. 
In March last year, a local task force on bail recommended centralized hearings on bond and a pretrial services program. Advocates say they're ready to see some progress. It's been almost one year since the bail task force came out with the recommendations, and implementation needs to happen now. Things are moving fairly slowly, and I realize that we do not have a unified court system in Cuyahoga County, and that can um, cause some t delays. Uh, there are some questions that need to be answered. You know, the simplest way to do it, frankly, would just be for, at the state level, them to you know, eliminate all of the different courts and just have one municipal court covering the entire county and one county court covering the entire county. That's the case in Columbus, for example. And as the county talks about bail reform and considers whether to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a new justice center, some judges say it's time to talk seriously about merging the municipal courts. I've been a judge for 21 years. We've been talking about centralized booking the entire time. We still don't have it. We're never going to have it. Um, we have a balkanized system of municipal courts that serve their local communities well. That's a tough bridge to cross for municipal judges who say the county's courts should focus on other issues first. It doesn't impact how fast we get our information, where prisoners are housed, how fast attorneys are, point, are appointed. Those are all things that can be handled extraneously and better than they are right now without raising this new issue of, of suburban court consolidation. As judges keep talking, we'll learn soon how bail reform is working in Cleveland. The city's municipal court plans to release data after the six-month mark next month. Ninety-two-year-old Stanley Bernath of Beechwood has told stories about his life as a teenager in Nazi concentration camps for more than four decades. But as his generation disappears, so too do these personal connections with history. This morning, Ideastream's David C. Barnett and Mary Fecto bring us the story of a new high-tech recording project that aims to preserve the stories of Bernath and of others and to share their experiences with future generations. Stanley Bernath remembers being packed into a boxcar as a teenager with dozens of terrified neighbors. He helped dig tunnels under his concentration camp to hide Nazi munitions, and he saw the embers of dead people drifting into the sky. But for years, he tried to leave all those memories behind. When the kids grew up, they knew I was a survivor, but we didn't talk about it. So we knew where they were from. We knew that my father was from Romania and my mother was from Hungary. And that was about it. And my cousin, there was a teacher who she had at school, asked if anybody in her class knew of a Holocaust survivor. So my cousin raised her hand and says, well, my uncle was in a concentration camp. Well, would you talk to him and see if he would be available to talk to us? They took my clothes. That started a four-decade journey for Bernath, speaking in classrooms. My new name was 70,465. To community groups, even to high school basketball teams. And after he speaks, audience members often gather around this example of living history. In a recent appearance, students lined up for autographs. They wanted pictures with him. They wanted just to touch him. In 2017, the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage got word of a new oral history project underway at filmmaker Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation at the University of Southern California. The mission is to preserve the testimonies of Holocaust survivors using 3D hologram technology. Stanley Bernath was pitched as a candidate. So we didn't even know what it was, so they told us to YouTube it. I am a Holocaust survivor and I am now an elderly gentleman. We saw it on YouTube, so how much can you see on YouTube? Not until we actually were there and that we got to see exactly what it was all about. The producers formulated a series of questions that audiences typically ask Holocaust survivors tailored to Bernath. And then they sat him inside a special 3D recording rig and had him tell his story. I had to sit for 10 one-hour sessions and they ask questions. Where are you from? Where did you go? What camp did you go to? And I had to answer all of those. They would give him a break every 50 minutes. 
for yeah. 10 minutes. He would get 10 up, minutes. walk around, but get a bite to eat. But sometimes I said, keep on going. There's 10 people that work on the project, from engineers to photographers yeah. to, there's about 100, I think 110 little cameras and 6,000 lights. And you know what? They bought new clothes for me, new shoes, new socks. A new belt. A new belt, everything new. Except underwear. <laughs> Finally, an artificial intelligence program was used to make connections between all of these pieces and parts. Now we didn't know. He's going to shoot us with machine guns. What we didn't know was going to happen. Actually, if you know Siri on your phone and you ask Siri a question, it's basically kind of like that. The Shoah Foundation then did a beta test run of the system at the Maltz Museum. Well, I think it's great because I won't be around forever. I'll be gone. It won't be very long. You have to remember the past. It should never be forgotten. Every few years, Stanley Bernath takes his family back to Europe to see some of the places that shaped his life. He recently visited three of the four concentration camps. You know, I've been doing that since I was in the Army. It was 1950s. I've been going back there ever since. Feels good to go back to where I was. People think, how could you do that, going back there, going back in a crematorium and going into the gas chamber? That doesn't bother me. It's really hard. I get emotional <laughs> to, to know that this man went through something so horrific like that. And even though he talks about it, and I know so much about what he went through, it's really hard to imagine him going through that. I can sit here and I can talk, but I get really emotional. That's okay, honey. Being emotional is fine. Now I'll tell you, going to Melk and Abensay for the first time, Yeah he actually got a little emotional. A little emotional. Because it's the first time First time I ever went back to Went those back two. there to those two. He got kind of choked up a little bit, from what I recall. I have a picture of my father walking out of the crematorium in Melk. Yeah. And you see the smokestack behind him. And I remember him just shaking his head going, <sighs> like that. So to me, Yeah. That was emotion. Well, you know, see a crematorium. Now he'd never seen the crematorium before. before. Not this close, but here we touch it. Look at that pictures. See, look at you, the hologram Stanley. No smiles. That's why I told everybody it's not me, it's my father. Back in Los Angeles, producers continue to refine the Bernath hologram. When the day comes that this three-dimensional ghost takes over for the original, young people will no longer be able to get a personalized autograph or to touch him. But perhaps his stories will take on a life of their own. The cost of water and the impact of higher rates to the Great Lakes region, the epidemic of stress and anxiety in girls, and why Sandusky made Election Day a holiday. Those are just some of the stories and topics we discussed this past week on The Sound of Ideas. One of the things that can happen for young people and sometimes grown-ups is that when they're very, very upset, they can feel like the world only has two categories things I like and things that are a crisis, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? And our job as loving adults is in those moments to find a way to say, hey, there's a giant third category, which are things you can handle. Again, maybe uncomfortable, you may not enjoy it, but you neither like it nor is it a crisis and I'm here to help you handle it. Really, this was saying Election Day was a day that all of our citizens could celebrate and all of our citizens could participate in. Uh, it was not to be detrimental towards Columbus Day, but if we had to make a change, that was the holiday that made the most sense to change from. Uh, and again, I think it's in, in lockstep with the other moves that we've made to celebrate our diversity. 
when they have that opportunity to work, there is a infectious joy that they also emulate. So the employers are kind of getting a twofold. They're getting a skilled worker, but they're also getting someone who has so much appreciation for that job and they will do their best and they are often um, the best dedicated and compassionate employee that that employer will have. This is not a Cleveland problem. Cleveland didn't make this problem. Uh, this is not a Cleveland issue. This is a national issue. These are infrastructure questions. This is how our country works. This is how we provide clean water uh, and manage sewage. So. Grant funding is very important. That grant funding is gone now. We do get federal loans, but remember, with loans comes debt. Tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, why exactly did Amazon pay zero dollars in federal income taxes over the last two years while making big profits? We'll have a local tax expert to explain why the federal tax code allows this for big corporations. Plus, we'll preview the annual Rethinking Race series at the University of Akron. Hope you can join us. You're watching Ideas Sunday. Thanks for spending part of your morning with us. Still to come, a conversation with the new CEO of the Cleveland Council on World Affairs on her vision for the organization and how to get more Northeast Ohioans engaged in global issues. But first, it's not the Saltzman family name that's become a Cleveland staple, but rather the name Dave. Dave Supermarkets is owned and operated by the Saltzman family, which now extends to a fifth generation. As the family grows, so too does the retail space. There are now 14 Dave's outlets, but the original location is on Payne Avenue at East 33rd Street until tomorrow. That's when the flagship store will close its doors for good, replaced by a new store in a new location opening later this week. Ideastream's Gabriel Kramer talked with neighbors of the original Dave's who are disappointed to see the grocer go. Chi Jen Ho lives at the Asian Evergreen Apartments in Cleveland's Asia Town. It's a senior living facility. In order to enjoy this monthly residence potluck, she, like anybody, needs access to a grocery store. Chi Jin Ho and I are standing outside of her apartment building and we're going to buy some groceries, which is pretty easy because there's a Dave supermarket just down the street. All right, you ready? The Asian Evergreen Apartments at East 38th and Payne is just five blocks away from a Dave supermarket at East 33rd and Payne. The convenience of this store will soon be gone. This Dave's location is moving from East 33rd and Payne to East 61st and Chester. It's too far for a Chi Jin Ho and her neighbors to walk, and many of the Asian Evergreen residents don't drive. There are other stores nearby, including a variety of Asian markets. But there are some items, such as Chi Jin Ho's lactose-free milk, which she relies on Dave's to buy. So it's now more difficult for these neighbors to get their groceries. But that's not something the owners of Dave's Markets take lightly. Have a good day. I think if you do right by your neighbors, um, they'll do right by you as well. That's David Saltzman. He shares the name of his great-grandfather, who shares the name of the 14 Dave's Markets that are owned and operated by the Saltzman family. David and his brother Aaron are now the fifth generation of Saltzmans to help run the place. Just because a neighborhood might have less doesn't mean, you know, from our standpoint and how we see it, that neighborhood deserves any less from a standpoint of how we consider a full service supermarket and providing the services we can provide at the highest level for those people that, that live in, in those neighborhoods. While the family is moving the store, they did not want to leave these neighbors without a place to get their groceries. So they did some research and surveyed the Payne Avenue customers and decided that they will provide a free shuttle service from Asiatown to the new Chester Avenue store. From our perspective, giving every single customer that comes to our Payne Avenue store an opportunity to come join us here. And in this particular situation, us as a company 
helping out to show that commitment, it was something we felt was, 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 was certainly the right thing and, and we're very happy to do it. The Payne Avenue store was the family's first store, their flagship location. My grandfather has spent the better part of every day for the last 60 years there. That store is, uh, means everything to us, so it's bittersweet for sure. But the new market will be much bigger. It will feature a drive through pharmacy and a long list of lunch counter options. The family believes that this store will provide a better service to a larger customer base. I really think that uh, once they come here to shop and um, be able to experience everything the new store is able to offer them, that they'll love it. For now, the complimentary shuttle will run four times per week at three different pickup spots. So a shuttle service is not a perfect situation for Chi Jin Ho, but she is much less worried about how she'll be getting her groceries. I don't think it would have mattered who was on the ballot. They've done the research. We're trying to get the truth so the public knows what's happening. Once a federal magistrate wrote that Ohio's lethal injection cocktail would very likely cause a condemned inmate to experience severe pain and needless suffering, Governor DeWine was quick to take action, last week suspending all planned executions for the Ohio Department of Corrections. Finding fault with the drug cocktail, a sedative, a paralytic, and potassium chloride to stop the heart, DeWine's ban will run until a new method of execution by drugs can be developed and deemed constitutional. We talked about the state's timeline and potential roadblocks Friday on 90.3 WCPN during the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable. Well, this was once again at that Associated, Ohio Associated Press Forum where he was asked about the availability of drugs and what's going to happen with Ohio's execution process. And uh, he made that comment and it was kind of at first uh, a question of d did he really say something really dramatic here and he did he said that he had delayed the execution of Wayne Keith Hennis which was supposed to happen this month he had delayed that until May but then he said nobody is going to be executed on my watch until we have a lethal injection delivery system essentially that stands up to federal court scrutiny and so he says he asked the Department of Rehabilitation and Correction to come up with a new lethal injection protocol this is something that a lot of states are dealing with there are some real concerns about some of the drugs including the drug Dazlam that have had problems in other states and so this is one of those things that other governors are dealing with but I think one thing that's really interesting here Dewan was also asked about his personal views on the death penalty I mean he's a, a devout Catholic he's deeply religious he identifies as pro-life but he's also a former prosecutor and former attorney general and his comments were that he believes that you know the death penalty is the law of the land and, but he wants to make sure that what happens when it comes to executions in Ohio is legal and sound. I think we're seeing, though, over the last couple of governors, a real change of attitude, perhaps, on the death penalty. The last several governors, uh, in November, when governor, former governors Celeste, Taft, and Strickland were all here for the unveiling of the Ohio Constitution exhibit, they got together and talked a little bit about executions and their real deep reservations about continuing with, with executions. Strickland's really interesting. He allowed more executions and gave clemency to fewer people than even John Kasich did. John Kasich had more clemency uh, and more reprieves that he issued. And, and so uh, Kasich is another one who was a deeply religious person who I think maybe struggled a little bit. So it, it, we're in a position here where I wonder if we haven't seen several uh, governors say that this is maybe something they're very concerned about. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of the state seeking a new drug cocktail or a new mix are we at square one here? Or is this something that's been ongoing for a while? Because we, we did have issues a couple of years back. Oh yeah, this has been ongoing for quite a while. I mean, when you look at the timeline, the changes that have happened here and uh, the, the botched executions, there have been at least, I think there have been five in Ohio, maybe more than that. But I mean, these have been situations that have gotten a lot of attention. The federal courts have looked at this. The federal courts have been watching Ohio's lethal injection process. That is what resulted in that ruling that uh, DeWine brought up. Um, Judge Michael Mertz brought that up, uh, saying that he was concerned that Ohio 
it, that it's death penalty delivery system right now is cruel and unusual punishment. So so what happens now? And and that's why DeWine has turned it back over to the prisons department and say, you folks come up with something that you think can go to court, can be looked at, and can then be litigated. But um, I'm starting to wonder if we're going to see an execution, not just this year. I mean, we've got 23 executions scheduled between now and 2023. I don't think necessarily we're going to see an execution this year because the process is, is really going to take a long time. But I'm starting to wonder if we're not going to see, uh, if we're going to see no executions even during the entire time of the DeWine administration. There's much more Ohio politics and news to come. Immediately after this program, stay with WVIZ PBS for The State of Ohio with Karen Kassler. This week, Karen talks to Ohio Senate President Larry Alboff, who represents Medina, Ashland, Richland counties, and portions of Holmes County. His Republican caucus has made criminal justice reform a priority for this legislative session. I, I think that the, the prison population is still far higher than it, than it should be. And I don't think that we should measure ourselves as a state um, by how many people we incarcerate. Uh, I, I think that if you were to compare our rates of incarceration to a lot of other countries, frankly, across the world, um, I think we'd be surprised at some of the company that we keep. And, uh, and particularly when you're talking about uh, nonviolent offenders and nonviolent drug offenders, uh, we have, we, we've made good progress in the last eight years, significant progress, drawing the distinction between people who are praying in our communities, people who've maybe made a mistake or two. I, I think we need to do a better job of, of drawing that distinction even further. For more than 95 years, the Cleveland Council on World Affairs has used education, public diplomacy, and dialogue to help Northeast Ohioans understand the issues and needs of the global community. In January, a new CEO took charge of the organization. Karina Van Vliet fills a position that had been vacant since June when Mara O'Donnell McCarthy died unexpectedly. An American born in France, Van Vliet served as a political affairs officer at the United Nations before coming to Cleveland in 2014. She did business development and communications work for the international law firm Jones Day before joining the council. Each month, Ideastream's Tony Ganser hosts a conversation on world affairs at the Happy Dog Bar and Restaurant in Cleveland's Detroit Shoreway neighborhood. The council is one of the partners behind the Happy Dog Takes on the World series. And Tony recently sat down with Van Vliet to talk about how she hopes to encourage Clevelanders to think internationally and why that's important. I think there's, there's an audience that the Cleveland Council on World Affairs has, and this is a joint programming that we do with the City Club of Cleveland, and so I think there is an appetite in the Cleveland community for an engagement and discussion of international topics, uh, but I feel that that audience is somewhat limited, and I feel that there's a lot of people who live in Northeast Ohio who, for whatever reasons, aren't engaging in a conversation about, about everything international. Um, and that's where this organization comes in and tries to offer forms for discussion and also a series of programs that targets students, that targets professionals, and, and finds ways to try to engage them and connect with, with what's going on in the world, but also with people from different countries. There are a number of organizations in Northeast Ohio kind of catering to different kinds of projects and also audiences. There's Global Cleveland, there's a number of cultural groups in Northeast Ohio. How does CCWA fit into that ecosystem? Are you competitors? Are you working together? Uh, there's no competition. The mission here is to get more people in the Cleveland, in Northeast Ohio, in the Cleveland community interested in international affairs. If the Cleveland Council on World Affairs can do that, great. If another organization that has a slightly different mission can do it, wonderful. It's, it's all about seeing a more engaged and globally engaged Cleveland. And the reason that's so important is because, I mean, this is very cliche, but economic development, development in general, and the future is increasingly global. And the kinds of questions that we're faced politically right now also are very global in nature. And we're at this moment in, in American history, in American political history, where we really have to ask ourselves, what is America's role in the world? It's shifting. It's shifting in very complicated ways. There's the, the traditional geopolitics of it and rises the rise of China and dealing with actors such as Russia, the Middle East, our European allies who are struggling and dealing with their own challenges. So that's the geopolitics. But there's also this whole host of global issues, whether it's climate change, migration, global pandemics, and all these issues that as humankind we need to deal with. 
And so it's incredibly important that at this, at this moment in time, as America is looking for its place in the world, and that place is changing, that educated American citizens be informed about these issues. In America's a big country, there's a lot going on here. Um, but like I said, increasingly, America's gonna have to make some, some difficult choices about how it wishes to operate in the world and how it wishes to be perceived and how it wishes to continue to remain a center of um, a center of attraction, a center of economic uh, dynamism, and, and just you know a, a powerful, you know, the most powerful country in the world. And in order to do that, I just think that it 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 really is so important for people to ask hard questions about what's going on in the rest of the world, be informed. These are these are very complicated issues, uh, and so. Come and attend forums that we're presenting. You will get some interesting information. You know, hopefully that encourages you to go and go deeper because obviously in conversations we can scratch the surface. But I think it's it's really vital uh, for our future. So you arrived in Northeast Ohio from New York, mm -hmm. correct? And you were working at the United Nations for a time. I was and, eight and, years. <laughs> and that ecosystem is very different than than Northeast Ohio. I think you have a very cosmopolitan, multinational uh, environment. How would you say that experience and, and what you were doing with the UN is informing what you're doing and trying to do in Northeast Ohio? In uh, working at the United Nations, I mean, that was an incredible privilege. And I got up every day at the United Nations working for world peace. That working for world peace and managing the interest of nation member states um, in the Security Council or in the General Assembly, there was also the political piece of it. That was, it was very political. And it ties back into the comments I made earlier about an engaged and informed citizenship. Um, and so the work of the United Nations towards peace can only be enhanced by more citizens in every country in the world being interested, being informed, and being engaged on international issues and trying to tackle head on, especially those global issues that we all have to address as mankind, as I mentioned, climate change, migration, and, and all these things that we have to work on together. And so that was a huge privilege to be able to work at the United Nations, and I feel that this in this role I can continue that passion and it's just sort of trying to apply it locally and apply that knowledge locally and try to get people excited about our world and excited about engaging with other countries and, and realizing the fundamental importance and the fundamental role that the United States plays in the world and, and caring about that. And this isn't just professional interest for you, this is in your DNA uh, to be internationalist and, and think global. Can you talk just a tiny bit about your upbringing and in, in that internationalism? So I'm a quintessential expat kid. Uh, my parents are American, but I grew up in France. And so from day one, I spoke English at home, French in school. So I grew up with these two cultures. And um, it, it was, I've always felt just by who I was, I mean, I'd go to class with my classmates. And anytime there was an issue with the United States, whether it was cultural, you know, music or whether it was food, you know, hamburgers or whether it was something going on politically. I remember the first Gulf War. I was in high school. I got asked questions about that. And, and so my entire life I have been an ambassador for the United States and you, you, you realize how important it is to represent your country and represent it well and that's something I've always wanted to do. And then from there I just developed uh, my entire professional career has been in international affairs. I've worked on bilateral French-U.S. relations. I moved on. I had eight years uh, at the United Nations as a political affairs officer. Uh, and then coming here, I really wanted to find an opportunity for me to take that interest and take that passion and share it with other people. And I'm tremendously honored that the board of directors of the Cleveland Council on World Affairs selected me and has given me that opportunity currently. And while this makes sense, I mean, going through your resume that you would take a position like this, the only reason it, it came available is because of the sudden death of Maura O'Donnell McCarthy, who died in July. Uh, and the organization had to grieve for a time and really kind of find its bearings and, and what it wanted to do. But there are plans to honor her uh, in the future and kind of address some of the things you've talked about. Uh, in, in regards to global understanding. Can you talk about that legacy you're trying to build? Yeah, and I'm so glad you brought up um, Maura Donna McCarthy and, and her legacy. She was a 
tremendously inspiring civic leader, uh, very beloved in the community, beloved by the team here at the Cleveland Council of World Affairs. And she really had this joy and this personal connection with especially international exchanges. Um, she, as a child, had lived abroad in Seoul, South Korea, and from there had just developed this real joy is the best word I can use to want to connect with other people. And so a lot of our visitor exchange programs, she would host them at her house. She was tremendously passionate about um, exciting young people. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the educational programs of the council and the model UNs and some of the other things we're doing in schools, that was something she cared passionately about. Um, and to honor her, we uh, have established the Maura Donna McCarthy Center for Global Understanding. And that center is um, going to house our adult education programs. And so we currently have two programs that we're launching. One is called Bridges to the World, which is a program for teachers, uh, mostly high school, mostly social science teachers, but giving them the tools to excite students about international affairs. And separately, we're also developing a global competence training for anyone who's interested in that. And that's sort of giving people the tools of being more receptive to people from other cultures. And that is something that Maura definitely was and definitely embodied. And so we feel that um, by uh, establishing this new center, that's the best possible way we can continue her work. So continuing that work, but what about your vision? Where, where do you want to go? You've only been in the post uh, a few weeks, uh, five or six weeks, but I wonder if you can talk about where you would like to see CCWA either fitting into that larger international ecosystem here or, or forging a new path. Uh, well, I think it's fundamental that we continue to deliver excellent programming for students, uh, for professionals, and for a larger audience. I think the piece that most intrigues me is figuring out how the Cleveland Council on World Affairs can intelligently insert itself into the conversation that we're having today in Cleveland about economic development. And th there's this whole conversation going on with you know, the Blockland Conference and all these initiatives and sort of trying to figure out what is Cleveland's comparative advantage economically, how do we sell that, how do we leverage it. Um, you know, and a lot of that is focusing on comparing Cleveland to other U.S. cities, and so there's a very domestic conversation. But inevitably, when you talk about business, manufacturing, trade, there's a huge international co component. We have some very large international companies that are headquartered here in Cleveland. We're very fortunate to do that. And so I feel like the, the international piece is something where CCWA could serve as a resource um, in this conversation on economic development. And I think that's something that we could, uh, where we could add value to the Cleveland community. An untapped workforce, that's how the Employment Collaborative of Cuyahoga County refers to people with disabilities as it seeks to encourage companies to hire them. People with disabilities typically are unemployed at rates double, even triple the rest of the working age population. The good news is that gap seems to be shrinking as unemployment rates fall and employers scramble to find workers. At a job fair for people with employment barriers, associate producer Lisa Ryan talked to job seekers and prospective employers. At the end of the day, they're no different than anyone else. Um, and typically, as I always say, we try to take the dis out of disability because everyone has an ability at the end of the day. According to the Wall Street Journal, more than 51,000 people left Social Security disability roles in 2017 because they found gainful employment. That's the most on record since 2002. But some individuals with disabilities still struggle to find work. They said, um, no, you're not, uh, we'll think about it. And they got another job interview, but a new person. Ain't nobody hiring. I get no calls. Sometimes I don't get no calls. Sometimes I don't get emails. At 26, Taylor Travato lives with her father in Seven Hills. She's held jobs before, but none that allowed her to live independently. Um, for a while, I wanted to do that, and I was my last job, uh, uh, AMT was part time, and I just decided, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been looking for a job for a while. Her dad says her disability presents a challenge for finding jobs. 
it is a barrier probably at most places. This is why we're here because you know this is more suited to, for the people that that the, these employers are looking for. Employers at the job fair represented fields including hospitality, finance, and retail. They seek people to fill their open jobs and say people with disabilities represent an untapped workforce. When we interview candidates, we're looking for the best candidate, whether that person has a disability or doesn't have a disability. Um, we want the best candidate for the job, and a lot of times we have found that just because somebody has a disability doesn't mean that they're not qualified to do a job. Next week on Ideas Sunday, I sit down to talk with a special teenager who you may remember. Tiba Farat Marlowe looked like this when she came to Cleveland after a roadside bombing in Iraq left her burned and disfigured. A picture in the PD spurred one woman to bring the toddler here for reconstructive surgery, and it turned into the battle of a lifetime. I had no idea as I navigated all these little steps what I I didn't realize, I didn't know what I had to do politically. I didn't know what I had to do with visas. I didn't know how to bring a little girl from a country where we were at war with to Cleveland, Ohio. 12 years and 19 surgeries later, you'll meet this now high school sophomore who excels in school and in life. That's going to do it for us for this morning. Up next, the state of Ohio with Karen Kassler. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Rick Jackson. We'll see you back here Friday night with more great ideas. Brought to you by Westfield, offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams.